Why weren't the National Guard there to begin with? They thought that they had sufficient resources. No, there's not a question of how they had been. They don't know. They clearly didn't know, and I take responsibility for not having them just prepare for war. The former president and his toadies do not want to face the facts. They're trying to do revisionist history on January 6th. The president is not authorized to deploy troops to the Capitol, separation of powers. It is at the hands of the Speaker of the House. That was Nancy Pelosi engaging in a go-to Washington, D.C. tactic. Accuse others of what you yourself are doing. The basic story here is Nancy Pelosi was responsible for having the National Guard at the Capitol on January 6th. And in the years following that day, she has been attempting to say that that is not the case. Because that would make her look incompetent or complicit, depending on what side of this you're coming from. Her latest iteration of revisionist history comes after this video was released. We have responsibility, Terry. We did not have any accountability for what was going on there, and we should have. This is ridiculous. You're gonna ask me in the middle of the thing when they've already breached the, the uh, inaugural stuff that, that uh, uh, should we call the Capitol Police? I mean, the uh, National Guard? Why weren't the National Guard there to begin with? They thought that they had sufficient resources. No, there's not a question of how they had been. They don't know. They clearly didn't know, and I take responsibility for not having them just prepare for war. Now, as you just heard there, she is very clearly saying she takes responsibility for not having the National Guard at the Capitol and prepared for January 6th. So naturally, she ran to MSNBC to complain that people were lying about what they saw on a video. Why do you think this is stirred up and a brouhaha on the, on the right and in some corners of the media today? Well, because of the, uh, the fact is that the president of the United States, the former president, and his toadies do not want to face the facts. They're trying to do revisionist history on January 6th. But we cannot let us be uh, dragged into their, again, uh, false impression of what happened that day. They know what happened that day. They know how serious it is and was and continues to have an impact on our country. And yet they want to call the, the people who were in their um, hostages. Last night I received the Lincoln Award. I was so proud of receiving that. And I said in my remarks, Lincoln built the dome on the Capitol. He insisted that it be built during the Civil War so that it could um, uh, show the resilience of America. And to see these people coming through the Capitol with their foul deeds and foul actions, waving Confederate flags and Nazi flags under Lincoln's dome was so shameful. And yet this president who incited, this former president who incited this insurrection would not send the National Guard for hours. People were harmed, people were killed, but died one way or another. And what did he do but try to deny that any of it happened? This is a terrible thing. But let us not take away the attention of what we need to do to go forward. We have to unify our country. We have to bring people together in a way, in a way that honors the vision of our founders, the sacrifice of our men and women in uniform, as well as the aspirations of our children. There's one part of her response there that's really interesting where she's talking about people dying. It's a perfect example of how the establishment will create a narrative, then change the narrative and just act like that was the narrative the entire time. In this case, Democrats and some Republicans were running around saying that Trump supporters were out there killing police on January 6th. And now that years have gone by, the narrative has changed to this. People were harmed, people were killed, but died one way or another. For those who don't speak politician, one way or another means having nothing to do with what occurred on that day. Unless you're referring to the officer suicides that happened after that, of course. Byron Donalds of Florida had a good moment in 2023 during a hearing where he broke down the whole situation with the National Guard. Troops from the National Guard were authorized by the president at the time, Donald Trump, on January 4. They were authorized. It was testified in this committee they were authorized. <clears throat> D.C. was able to take advantage of them in the capacity that, that D.C. wanted to save for the couple of requests that you also wanted. One thing it's important to indicate, Mr. Chairman, is that for, D for National Guard troops to be deployed to the Capitol, it requires a Capitol Police Board 
to actually issue a state of emergency for troops to come on Capitol grounds. And the police board is made up of the architect of the Capitol, the head of Senate security, the head of House security, and the chief of the Capitol police. And by my understanding, three of those four people report to the Speaker of the House. And the Speaker of the House at that time was Nancy Pelosi. So when we want to talk about National Guard being here and the timetable of them getting here, it's important to understand that there were National Guard in the District of Columbia, and their limitation of coming to the Capitol was not due to anybody else because the president is not authorized to deploy troops to the Capitol, separation of powers. It is at the hands of the Speaker of the House. If you want more examples of the January 6th narrative versus reality, here's some of what came out after the tapes were released. For many, he was the face of the Capitol riot, wearing a fur headdress with horns, bare chested, his face painted. Watch out. He was among the first to break into the building and headed for the U.S. Senate chamber, where he sat in the presiding officer's chair that was vacated by Vice President Mike Pence and scribbled this note. It's only a matter of time. Justice is coming. He then led a kind of prayer with his bullhorn. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for gracing us with this opportunity. Prosecutors asked for the maximum sentence under federal guidelines, just over four years, saying he egged on other rioters and posted vitriolic messages on social media in the months before January 6th. What did Jacob Chansley do to receive this punishment? To this day, there is dispute over how Chansley got into the Capitol building. But according to our review of the internal surveillance video, it is very clear what happened once he got inside. Virtually every moment of his time inside the Capitol was caught on tape. The tapes show that Capitol Police never stopped Jacob Chansley. They helped him. They acted as his tour guides. Here's video of Chansley in the Senate chamber. Capitol Police officers take him to multiple entrances and even try to open locked doors for him. We counted at least nine officers who were within touching distance of unarmed Jacob Chansley. Not one of them even tried to slow him down. Chansley understood that Capitol Police were his allies. Video shows him giving thanks for them in a prayer on the floor of the Senate. Watch. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for paying the inspiration needed to these police officers to allow us in this building. The violent demonstrations that consumed the Capitol this week left five people dead. Among them, 42-year-old Brian Sicknick, a Capitol Police officer since 2008, a native of New Jersey. One of the mysteries of the January 6th insurrection is solved tonight. The D.C. medical examiner today ruled that Capitol Hill police officer Brian Sicknick died of natural causes. But Brian Sicknick should not be reduced to a prop for the political ambitions of the Democratic Party. He was a human being. The facts of his life matter, including how he died. To this day, media accounts describe Sicknick as someone who was, quote, slain on January 6th. The video we reviewed proves that is a lie. Here is surveillance footage of Sicknick walking in the Capitol after he was supposedly murdered by the mob outside. By all appearances, Sicknick is healthy and vigorous. He's wearing a helmet, so it's hard to imagine he was killed by a head injury. Whatever happened to Brian Sicknick was very obviously not the result of violence he suffered at the entrance to the Capitol. This tape overturns the single most powerful and politically useful lie the Democrats have told us about January 6th. And it was indeed a lie. Tomorrow, we need to go into the Capitol. Into the Capitol. What? No! Peacefully! Fed! 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 Monument Hill. Under public pressure, the January 6th committee finally interviewed Ray Epps. Epps told the committee that he never entered the Capitol and therefore never committed a crime. His text messages showed that at 2.12 p.m., he boasted to his nephew that he had, quote, orchestrated the protests at the Capitol. He admitted he helped get people there. Yet curiously, congressional Democrats consider Ray Epps an ally, not an insurrectionist. 
Tonight, we can tell you that at the very least, Ray Epps lied in his sworn testimony to the January 6th committee. Epps testified that when he sent the text messages to his nephew, he had already left the Capitol grounds to return to his hotel room. That is not true. The surveillance footage we found shows that, in fact, Ray Epps remained at the Capitol for at least another half an hour. You're seeing that on your screen now. What was Epps doing there? We can't say, but we do know that he lied to investigators. The January 6th committee likely knew this too. Democrats had access to the same tape. Tonight, the January 6th committee wants to talk to another Republican congressman. The panel has asked Georgia Congressman Barry Loudermilk to come in for an interview about a Capitol tour that it says took place on January 5th, the day before the riot. The Capitol was closed at the time because of the pandemic. At one point, the January 6th committee publicly accused Republican Congressman Barry Loudermilk of Georgia of leading a reconnaissance mission through the Capitol building the day before. They were looking for some member of Congress that was involved in all this. The surveillance tape that we reviewed shows this story is a lie, and the Democrats on the committee knew it was a lie when they told it. The so-called reconnaissance mission Democrats alleged was nothing more than Congressman Laudermilk giving a guided tour to his constituents from Georgia, none of whom were, quote, insurrectionists. Laudermilk didn't even take the group inside the Capitol building. They walked through a congressional office building down the street. The FBI totally cleared them. The committee knew this before they actually made their accusations against me. They wanted to create this story that would, uh, you know, fit where they wanted the evidence to lead. Later that day, Senator Hawley fled after those protesters he helped to rile up stormed the Capitol. See for yourself. When the committee wasn't accusing Republican office holders of planning riots on January 6th, it was accusing them of running away from those riots like cowards. In the case of Senator Josh Hawley of Missouri, the committee and their allies accused him of both. Josh Hawley is a To prove that Josh Hawley was a coward, the committee released video of him loping out of the building on the afternoon of January 6th with a police escort. The tape became a staple on social media. But in fact, the surveillance footage we reviewed shows that famous clip was a sham, edited deceptively by the January 6th committee. The clip was propaganda, not evidence. The actual videotape shows that Hawley was one of many lawmakers being ushered out of the building by Capitol Hill police officers. And in fact, Hawley was at the back of the pack. The coward tape was a lie one of many from the January 6th committee. Happy holidays, Merry Christmas, Happy Schwanza, Happy Hanukkah. 